What's up, everybody? We have some people to show up here, and uh, <clears throat> got a guest today. I'm going to be interviewing. Uh, wait for him to show up. We're gonna do a little conversation today, guys. Welcome, guys. Welcome. This should be a good little show today, guys. I got someone joining me, so uh, I'm chewing gum. <clears throat> it's called Phallum Gum. No sugar. So I'm waiting for Derek to show up. I got Derek, uh, Derek Nance is joining me today. <clears throat> this is called Phallum Gum. This is the gum that I chew. <clears throat> It's uh, pretty healthy stuff, no sugars or anything like that. So yeah, I'm just waiting, uh, waiting for my guest to show up here, guys, and uh, this should be an interesting conversation. Got Derek Nance coming on. He's been eating raw meat for about 12 years. No, this isn't candy, dude. I'm not gonna chew gum during an interview anyways, but no, it's just gum. It's called masticating gum. It's to uh, build up your jaw muscles and what's up guys, what's going on? What's going on everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Got a little food today too, I'm gonna eat. But I wanna do the uh, do the interview first. <clears throat> Oysters are nasty. No way, dude. You're banned. How dare you? Welcome guys, welcome. Feed me butt us, is that you doing mewing daily? Um, <clears throat> I practice mewing mostly at night when I go to sleep. But I do do it throughout the day too. Cause I had a jaw injury uh, about 10 years ago and they had to get my wire jaw, uh, my jaw wired shut. And so what happened was, is they set back my lower jaw just a little bit. So my, my jaw bones grew back incorrectly. So I've had to practice mewing to help uh, like open up my breathing, my breathing ways. <clears throat> Cause my jaw doesn't sit the way it naturally should. So uh, at nights I try to, I always practice, even during the day I practice pushing my tongue forward and uh, it actually helps like my breathing abilities and uh, at night, especially when you're laying down on the ground. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, hopefully Derek knows I'm live. Biggest mental benefit from my diet uh, it just, uh, it really grounds me and I don't know, it just, uh, my energy is very stable. So that helps out mentally, I guess. Very stable throughout the day, able to think clearly, you know, I don't use like any drugs or alcohol or caffeine or anything like that anymore. So, so my mental energy is just very stable. I don't have like really any spikes or dips anymore. And obviously that uh, transmits over to um, psychological to psych psychological benefits, you know, mood and things like that. There's Derek. 
All right, Derek, you can uh, join the stream if you want. Derek, there should be a box on the screen that says uh, request to join live or join live. Yeah, there you go, man. There he is. <clears throat> Let's see if we can link up here. Derek. Hey, what's going on, man? I'm doing all right. Which way should I orientate my camera? I think that, yeah, that should work right there. Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's, let me get I'm, my charger in place. I've tried doing it sideways before, and it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really seem to work. Yeah. All right, man. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. See, well, cool, man. To... Good to finally meet you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've been trying to set this up for a couple of weeks. Yep, yep, yeah, for sure, man. So, so yeah, I know about you uh, from your YouTube channel. So when I first uh, started getting into like the diet stuff a few years ago, I uh, was watching your channel and like you know asparagus and all that stuff, and you had a pretty. Uh, I mean, you still got your channel up, right? Yeah, it's up. It's just not active. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty legendary channel though, man. Like there was really there's really like nothing on YouTube that's uh pretty close to what you got going on, man. So that was like really interesting stuff, getting into the raw diet and kind of seeing how you did things and uh so everybody that doesn't know, this is Derek Nance. He's uh thirty eight from Kentucky, he's been on raw meat for twelve years. And uh, you got a pretty interesting story. I've watched a couple of your other interviews on, on YouTube and stuff like that. So why don't you just uh, introduce kind of like how you got into eating raw meat, man, and kind of your journey into that. All right. Yeah, my journey goes back uh, 15 years or so ago when I was uh, diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and I had a lot of uh, intolerances and allergies and a uh, reoccurring viral infection like i had i was crippled with pain like my joints when i'd have these autoimmune flare-ups they mm -hmm. would just hurt and i wouldn't be able to get out of bed and they'd come and go and so i'd have relief and then i'd have flare-ups again and the mainstream medicine couldn't do anything they they gave me this diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome which means nothing <laughs> means my immune system's going absolutely haywire and they have no reason to know why and so i had to start investigating for myself and so through process of elimination i found wheat and dairy and some of these foods that i was eating daily that i thought you know oh it's a staple of the american diet well they were giving me problems and i think they're giving a lot of other people problems too and they just don't realize it and so i started eliminating foods and feeling better but still not optimal because I, I had some type of digestive insufficiency. My glands just weren't secreting enough digestive enzymes and my pancreas wasn't producing enough insulin. I was having sugar spikes, energy drops, and just overall insufficient digestion to where I couldn't absorb the, the proper amount of nutrients to nourish my body. Mm -hmm. All lessons I've learned, hindsight, what I'm looking back on, what I was going through, and I can see what I was going through, but at the time, you know, I was lost, and I didn't know what to do. So I experimented with a lot of different diets, experimented with uh, Mediterranean and even vegetarian for a, a certain period of time, noticing marked improvement as far as not having severe pain and uh weird issues with the digestion, like when I was eating wheat and dairy, but not being able to nourish myself, still not gaining strength and energy and vitality. So, you know, through these extreme elimination diets, I found what foods weren't good for me, but then trying to find out what foods were good was a little more difficult because cooked meat at the time still made me feel bloated, still made me feel sick. And then I 
insufficient fat digestion. I couldn't eat things with a lot of fat. And I had, I had a congested liver. A lot of people will have that. And uh, I think vegetable oils were a big trigger for me. Uh, cooked vegetable oils, you think that, you know, oh, yeah, vegetable oils are healthy. They're the worst. And uh, for years, we've been sold this. You know, switch out your butter for uh, Crisco and all these other types of artificial oils. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had liver congestion and, and pains in my stomach from, from this pressure from my gallbladder not being able to empty out properly. And so tweaking the diet and still not getting much results, I was still real ill, you know, back in 2010. And just I happened across a Weston Price Foundation site and started studying his work with uh, some of the native tribes. Mm -hmm. Out of some happenstance, one of the links to one of his uh, articles on the Native Americans guts and grease diet led me to uh, a raw paleo forum where there's a lot of people advocating for raw meat based diets. And at the time I was so desperate and I didn't know what else to do. And I said, why not? <laughs> and so I had a these two milking goats that I was using for milk for my kids. My kids were being weaned. I had a couple of young ones that were a couple of years, three and four years old. And so I was giving them goat's milk and I was drinking a little bit of goat's milk because I seemed to be able to tolerate it a little better. But it was a very dark, cold winter. And I think it was when the H1N1 came through and a lot of us got sick with it years, years back. And I was just out for like weeks just not able to to function or to work and these goats were banned all time all day long they're pygmy goats they're hard to keep in they're a handful to anyway mm -hmm. so uh, so i ended up processing them myself for the first time you know it was the first time i ever processed an animal and so i had all this goat meat in my freezer at the same time i was learning about the raw meat diet and the two just okay i got all this goat meat and so I started eating it raw and then uh, amazing within a, a week or two, like the pains in my stomach went away, my appetite increased and I just started eating it and uh, craving it. And mm -hmm. I really haven't looked back since I've just gone from there and then evolved. And uh, I think at the time it was more of a primal based diet because, you know, I was uh, following Ogenus Mondoponens and so his insistence on dairy and a lot of these other foods um, I was doing all right, like uh, with small amounts of dairy at the time, but still wasn't completely optimal, but uh, well, head and shoulders above everything that I was experiencing before. So I just started tweaking the diet, looking at different approaches to raw animal foods, and then, you know, finding what worked for me personally. Okay. Yeah. Nice, man. Yeah. Sounds like you had quite the, uh, <clears throat> quite the journey. And I think that's what's cool about this diet is that you know i think uh, healthy people can adopt it and they can get even healthier but it seems to be one of those things that like really can like save certain people that have like really serious stuff going on you know and that's what i think is like so amazing about it and like uh, more people like you need to i think get out there and, and show people that you know if you're sick or if you got something serious going on this can be like the thing that can that can help uh pull you back you know and uh that's pretty cool. So you mentioned uh, like wheat, wheat and dairy, like being an issue. And like, I've noticed that too, like reading online, that seems to be like a common thing that people have issues with is wheat and dairy. And for me personally, like, um, I had issues with uh, bread. So I didn't notice that until I quit it. <laughs> so like when I first got was I got into um, um, Okay, you pause there for a sec. Uh, I got into uh, the gluten-free thing, right? That's like one of the uh, one of the paths that people go down. So first thing I did was I quit bread, and then I noticed like major differences in my energy, like my mood. It was like life-changing for me, man. So that's what got me into researching like wheat and gluten and like celiac disease and like all that stuff. Uh, what's your opinion on that, man? Like about the whole like celiac disease thing? Do you think it's because we've modified the gluten grain or we've modified the, the crops of the wheat, or do you think it's actually like the, the glyphosate or whatever they're spraying on it? What do you think? The problems with wheat are manifold. They, they, they come from different 
directions. There are some people who are just specifically allergic to wheat for whatever reasons, classic celiacs. And then there's mm -hmm. other people who are just intolerant. And that intolerance could be caused by, say, gut permeability issues because of glyphosate, mm -hmm. and modification of, of wheat to make it higher in gluten content, and the bromated wheats and the processed the chemicals that are also accompanying the wheat. So we can't really say because we've extracted ourselves from the traditional, you know, slow leavened yeast bread that was produced for hundreds and hundreds of years, a food which yep. was by no means optimal to the evolution of the human diet, but it was something we could persist on and people developed uh, adaptations too. But those adaptations are very fragile and they're, they're apt to be disrupted, especially with the uh, the advent of glyphosate, increased gut permeability just because of our overall lack of gut integrity and our diminished microbiome. So there's a, a manifold of issues that go into why some people can tolerate wheat and why some people can't. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to sell it by any means. I don't say that if you can tolerate wheat and you feel healthy on it, then more power to you. I just like to say that there are some people who just can't physically uh, metabolize it and a uh, the wheat proteins, especially when they get past the blood, uh, the, the gut permeability, when you have leaky gut and then those uh, gluten proteins go straight into the brain, they cause all types of havoc. You know, the mm -hmm. brain fog and, and even psychological, so-called psychological problems. I think a lot of that is just the food intolerances and food not quite processing well in the body and all the toxic metabolites not being able to be filtered out properly. And then they mm -hmm. manifest as emotional and, and depression and all these other types of symptoms that they just put these labels on, but they truly do not understand the underlying causes. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, man. Yeah. Cause you, you hear a lot about, uh, you know, modifying the, the gluten grain and, um, and that actually makes sense that maybe our bodies aren't adapted to digest the, the but also the glyphosate thing is starting to come out. I don't know if you uh, if you follow uh, Dr. Stephanie Staneff, but she's like the big, the big. Uh, she's on the forefront of the glyphosate research, mm -hmm. and so she's bringing out all this information about glyphosate now. And I think that's that's uh, like probably a main factor for a lot of people, man. So that's yeah. very interesting. Um, so and then on to the dairy thing. So like that's another kind of rabbit hole, man. Is like um, some people seem to not be able to tolerate dairy very well. Uh, some people say that they can tolerate like A2 better, which is like, you know, goat's milk and, you know, wild buffalo milk and all that stuff better than A1 milk, which would be like the Holstein cow. Um, I personally don't notice much of a difference. Like I can tolerate both pretty well. But um, do you think there's something to that? Do you think that, that we've like maybe overbred the Holstein cow and that's created some sort of mutation? Or do you think that uh, like pasteurizing the milk is the main culprit there? What do you think about that? Uh Again, I don't think there's a main culprit. I think it's a, an amalgamation of all the issues. You know, all these cows, yeah, grain fed, what are they fed? And is the glyphosate getting in the water supply of all the farms? Is, is there mm -hmm. a general uh, lack of a microbiome in the majority of people? Because the most kids have been treated with antibiotics or they weren't nursed. And so, like, there's all these other issues that go into the tolerance of, of dairy, just like the tolerance of wheat. And so I've I don't tolerate dairy, like, and there's people in my family, too, that I know that have just reached a certain age, and they just can't tolerate it anymore, and they, there's something called a lactose persistence gene, and then people who are traditional herds peoples that have adapted over the last 10,000 years tend to have a, what they call lactose persistence, where they have produced the enzymes after age five to continue to digest lactose. And there's some people who are able, even if they don't have that heritage, they just have the microbiome, they have the, the proper enzymes to, to break it down. But that's something that can be lost. And especially like early middle age, you know, people get a little older and they, they start not producing as much enzymes in general. And so there's a lot of people who just acquire lactose intolerance and they don't really know exactly when or why or what all the factors are, they just can no longer digest it properly. And I'm of the mind that if you have a problem with it, you might want to avoid it. And there's a lot of people who are on the fence for years, 
and they struggle with it and they go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm one of those people that I just had to do away with it. Yeah. And the problem is, is finding a, a good source of minerals and electrolytes and proteins and fats that equal the profile of, of dairy because it's very nutritious. You know, don't yeah. get me wrong. There's a lot of good nutrients in there. It's just, yeah. can we access it? Are our bodies able to, to break it down and assimilate it without problems? And for me, it, it causes a gut mucus. And, you know, I get these over mucus. And if I, I can drink it for a little bit and I can drink tolerate a certain amount. But if I get a over that amount, it inhibits my ability to digest fats. And I'm on a high fat based ketogenic diet where the majority of my calories come from fat. So I'm highly fat adapted. And so if I put too much dairy down, it seems to undo that delicate process. So you know, I'm a different animal as far as that's concerned because I've been eating the high fat keto diet for the last uh, 12 years. Yeah, interesting. So, so um, the issues that you have with milk, do you have those same issues with like butter and cheese? Um, not as much. Like, uh, there is a difference. Yeah, pure milk with the lactose in it, uh, I definitely notice a much greater formation of mucus and bloating and, and feeling of indigestion. And then a uh, cheese, I can handle some hard cheeses like, uh, you know, sharp cheddar. You know, it has almost no lactose in it at all. And if it's a raw, you know, organic grass-fed sharp cheddar, I, mm -hmm. I eat a little bit of it and not, not have any problems. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. So uh, so what's your diet like today, man? Like what's uh, – give me an example of kind of what you eat throughout the day. Uh, I'm on a sheep-based diet now. I process my own mutton. One reason is uh, mutton is just easier for me to personally process. A cow is a lot of work, and I don't have the storage or the space. And uh, but also notice that sheep fat, grass fed, pasture raised sheep fat has a softer, more digestible fat. And, it, and cow fat can be a little waxy and a little hard, but sheep fat, the belly fat especially, can be really just soft and melt in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And I've read reports also that it's a higher in a DHA. And I don't know, I haven't seen scientific analysis recently, but I've heard reports that it's actually higher in the CLA and the DHA and some of these. Uh, omegas uh, threes mm -hmm. the healthy ones yeah so you know that's that's my approach i've been doing that for so long that i, I prefer sheep and it's something that i crave and i'm if i have to i'll eat cow i'll eat game meat i'll even eat a little bit of fish and other things and i think some of that are are part of it as well every now and then i'll have a craving for you know fish and I'll, I'll eat a little bit of fish every now and then mm -hmm. but for the most part it's just uh uh, I'll show you what I got here. So, yeah, it's just uh, sheep fat. Like, this is the uh, fat trimmings and then uh, some of the sheep meat. Nice. Here's a piece of liver. Mm. I just cut up the organs and then I think even got a little piece of heart. Well, this is the fatty cut off the heart. You see mm -hmm. how it's encased in a layer of fat. Yep. And all of it has different nutrient contents. All the organs, I think, have their own uh, uh, mineral contents and their own uh, enzymes and natural living uh, essences, yeah. if you want to call it. And so I believe that eating nose to tail has allowed me to, to get all the nutrients that I'd be missing, you know, say, if, since I took dairy out, since I've taken a lot of plant foods and vegetables and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to feel optimal, I feel like I need to eat, you know, nose to tail and, and, and the organs. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, since you showed off, since you showed off your meal, man, I'll show you what I got. This is uh, being in the heartland here. This is basically my main staple, grass-fed beef. Uh -huh. I get 100% grass-fed beef uh, from local farmers here. And this uh -huh. is usually I get like an arm roast or a chuck roast or something like that. Okay. Uh, this is really That's lean. It's usually not this lean, but I don't mind lean meat. I actually, uh, I actually prefer lean for some reason, but only if I can uh, like eat some some butter with it, like some of this grass fed um, so un raw unsalted butter. Mm -hmm. And I get that from Amos Miller's because I can't get that anywhere around here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty much pretty much mostly beef, uh, a little bit of chicken, and uh, a little bit of fish. I like swordfish quite a bit. <clears throat> So that's pretty much what I'm eating. Um, but yeah, man, if you want to chow down, we can have a little uh, have a little mukbang if you want here to kick it off. 
happening. Yeah, we can cheers. I always have to eat fat with my meat, so I put a little bit of fat with it. Yeah, yeah. Cheers, man. So, um, I had eggs, so yeah, I'll drink eggs every now and then as well. I think mm -hmm. the eggs have, you know, some B vitamins and uh, some of the minerals and calcium, like when you drink the whole egg yolks raw. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also good to add on, you know, for anybody into the carnivore diet who wants to get their feet wet, you know, just start yeah. out with all eggs. So do you do do you do the whole eggs, or you just you eat the whole thing? Because I know a lot of people just like to do the yolk. I'm 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 just a yolk guy. And all right, yeah, okay. And so I should specify on that as well because uh, I don't know what it is if it's some type of a allergy, but if I eat too many egg whites, you know, and a lot of times it comes from you know, grain fed chickens, I try to get organic. But whatever it is, if I eat too many egg whites, I actually notice some soreness in my joints. I can feel it. Like if really? I get too much of the white protein. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, if I get grain fed meats, it, it'll do the same thing. I've had like autoimmune conditions that go back for years. Whatever it is, there's something in it that'll, I mean, it's not debilitating. It's nothing that, you know, I would complain about or go to the hospital about but I'm, I'm very sensitive i'm very intuitive so like i'll notice if i eat too many egg whites i'll get sore joints but mm. it doesn't happen if i just eat the yolks so i mean i have a some idea that the some protein in the whites i just don't metabolize properly and that's cause interesting. inflammation yeah so that's inflammation is the key of most disease mm -hmm. and and the thing is it gives us subtle signs and most people just don't read those signs. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I've become so attuned to what's good for me and what's not because I had to go through such a severe autoimmune condition mm -hmm. that I'm hypersensitive. Even years later, you know, I can notice when I'm starting to get something that's not right. And I try to tie it to instinct. I try to tie it to, okay, what am I doing that might be causing this? And so, yeah. bites are just, yeah, something that I. <clears throat> Like I said, I can tolerate a few, and on like a really hot day, if I'm sweating a lot and I, you know, just deplenished in electrolytes, I'll take a couple whole eggs and drink that with a little bit of a lime water, and that's more of a Paleolithic Gatorade because it has all the minerals, electrolytes, and the citric acid that you know helps them assimilate. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that that I'll do, but usually no more than a couple of whole eggs a day, and then you know. Every now and then, I've even experimented with uh, egg yolk flush. That's something that if you feel like you're having trouble, you're going through a funk and your digestion, something's not working very well. Mm -hmm. I'll drink a couple of egg yolks like every couple of hours throughout the day with a little bit of lime water and fast. Just egg yolks and lime water for mm -hmm. two days. Mm -hmm. and then it'll flush you like eventually it'll it'll get to you and it'll flush out whatever that is and then i usually feel immensely better afterwards but i don't recommend a lot of these things to newbies i don't recommend them just to everybody because uh people tend to go overboard with the flushing <laughs> people think that they have to go through extreme fast or they need to go you know through purges and all this stuff and yeah. detox and I, i'm more of a gentle approach i think you should nourish yourself so that's where egg yolks, you know, gentle and nourishing mm -hmm. and extreme. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree, man. I'm a, I'm about – like three eggs a day seems to be good for me. Like if I do like a breakfast, which sometimes I'll kind of cycle into eating breakfast again, I'll do like three eggs for breakfast and like a little bit of milk or something. But So that will get me up to like six eggs a day. But like, yeah, I think eating like 12, 20, 30 eggs a day is like a little overkill. You know, I don't know people that are into the primal diet and endogenous and stuff. They've read where he's like prescribed that to people, certain people, you know, For like, sick, like sick people, you know, like, hey, eat, you know, eat. If you can't eat anything, eat like 30 eggs a day, 40 eggs a day, you know, but. um, And the flush, that's what I'm saying, I think that there's something to it for intermittently for certain periods of time. If you have an underlying condition, I think that there's a certain approach to that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I just recommend it as a staple, like, you know, 30 bananas a day or 30 eggs a day. It's <laughs> sustainable. Yeah. So, uh, so that food you're eating right now, when did you harvest that animal? I harvested this one uh, probably about a week and a half ago, about 10 days. And so and it's been 
in my fridge, uh, not frozen, you know, still mm -hmm. fresh. And uh, I actually went down to Tennessee. That's this uh, horse boarding farm where this lady's got a flock of them and she's been calling them out to me. And I wish I would have found her a few years ago because she had a bunch more that she just got rid of. So, it's oh, really? but you know, it's out in like a, a floodplain valley in a tennis up right up in the mountains of Tennessee. So it's a, uh, you know, very pristine, you know, very clean land. And so mm -hmm. I can kind of tell from the taste of the animals and I've had to travel far and wide to get what I'm looking for. Cause locally, a lot of the land around here in Kentucky's over farmed, they overgraze it with cattle. They over plant mm -hmm. it with this fescue grass. That's really not the healthiest forage. Mm -hmm. And so, and they overcut the hay. So they, they deplete and they take a lot of the minerals off the land. So even if something certified grass fed and certified organic this, organic that, if yeah. it's founded by an industrial agricultural uh, wasteland, then it's probably the runoffs getting into the land somehow. I know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a bummer, man. Mm -hmm. It's like everywhere you go, that stuff is just <clears throat> in all the land. And So like with sheep, uh, you can get like 100% grass fed. Are they not like supplement any grain or anything? No. The good thing about sheep and certain breeds are better than others because they've been breeding them for generations to fatten up on corn. But mm -hmm. if, they don't, if they'll revert back if they're, you know, lush enough pastures. And the other thing is you have to let them raise up long enough. A lot of people want to butcher lambs when they're, you know, under a year old. And you just don't get the right development. They're not mature. Like the marrow's not even filled out in their bones. And mm -hmm. they don't get fat on them. And so what you have to do for natural free-range ruminant animals is let them age up two years. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I agree. A, it's only about a year and a half, but it, it had enough fat, but not optimal. Yeah. What they do with cattle is they have to butcher them before two years old. And there's some type of regulation. If the cow's older than like three years, they have to cut the spine out and they have to throw away all these right. parts and organs because of, the BSE, the mad cow scare, yeah. they don't allow cattle to raise up naturally. And it's a shame because the best meat I've ever had are like over 10 years old. It's the best meat, man. Yeah, it's the best, dude. I've gotten some aged beef from my farmer, and mm -hmm. I think he went up to like three or four years or something like that. But it's, it's the only cuts of beef that I can get that's got that nice, thick, yellow layer of fat on it. And I, and I had to research it. I was like, how come some of these cuts are really yellow? And some of the cuts aren't, you know, and he said, well, that's aged, you know, they've, they've been living for like three, four years. So I guess they had adequate time to absorb all the nutrients. And, and, uh, I learned that from my bison farmer too. I was getting some bison locally here and I met this guy. He's been, um, he was a Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone park ranger for 25 years. And then he became a bison farmer after that. Oh, yeah. so this, this guy just had just an, a wealth of knowledge, man. <clears throat> just one of those guys that could just, blow your mind with stuff that he learned from the land you know but he uh he told me some things about bison that were really interesting you know um one of them was that yeah like the more the older they get basically when you're eating like uh veal and stuff like that <clears throat> the nutrients haven't um accumulated enough into the tissues you know so it's not as nutrient dense as an aged animal and uh he was also talking about how in the wild <clears throat> um well basically in general animals will concentrate nutrients uh, into different parts of their body, depending on kind of um, what they're using the most, I guess. So, like, <clears throat> I'd have to reread his email again to get exactly what he's talking about. But he's basically saying in certain areas, like, some of the animals will uh, they will only eat the hind quarter and they'll leave the front quarter of the animal because they know that the hind quarter has the most uh, um, accumulation of nutrients into those muscles. So that was, like, my first introduction into, like, there's actually different concentrations of nutrients in different cuts of the animal too. And all that stuff is just really interesting, man. Yeah, and uh, yeah, notice with, with the buffalo too, they, yeah, their fat will yellow if they get older. And uh, I was told that's keratin, uh, uh, keratinoids, you know, the vitamin A, yeah. they, they build up in the tissues as the yeah. animal, as they build up more fat, but also higher levels of CLA, which mm -hmm. is a very healthy fatty acid and uh, DHA even, they build up in the fats and it takes time for them to mature and for them to build up because in the first stages of growth, all their energy is going into growing the tissues. And so it's it's not as rich, it's not as vital if you, you 
butcher an animal <laughs> right in the middle of its teenage growth spurt. <laughs> and that's basically well, what you do. And, yeah. uh, and then especially rams, like I eat like both male and female animals, but you know, they'll castrate the rams. And so they're low testosterone. And so you don't get the, the benefits of, you know, having a balance between estrogen and testosterone in the animals we eat. You know, cattle, they, they, they castrate them into steers and, mm-hmm. and uh, lambs, a lot of times they'll castrate them. But some of the better animals I've had are three, four-year-old rams, you know, intact. Mm. And uh, the key is to not let them overrun themselves like when they're with the females. You have to segregate them. If you segregate a ram and give them like a couple – you know, friends to hang out with weathers and what they'll do is they'll just sit around and eat and they'll eat and they'll eat and they'll eat and they'll get fat like off the land but you have to let them age to be about three or four years old and mm-hmm. most part it's just not economically feasible to right. raise like that for meat they can't keep them around for two years they have yeah. to get them over so the only way to do it is you have to go to farms that they're ready to circulate out their breeding stock and so sometimes you can get coal animals but oftentimes by then there's something wrong with them because why are they calling out their animals? So right. you have to be, you know, a scout. You have to go out there and um, with the hunter gatherer mentality and <laughs> to, to find what, what's optimal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, so are you a, are you like a, out in the country a little bit? Or are you like in the city? Or where are you located? Are you because I know I'm, you're butch- you're slaughtering your own animals, right? I'm located in the in the city. Okay. I, well, I travel out to the country to get the animals and well, what yeah. I'm, I'm more of a nomad. I got a house in town and then I stay at a house in the country with my kids sometimes and then that's cool. Know, and I travel. So there's it's no telling where I'll be from one day to the next. Yeah. So so you just cut up the animals in your backyard, right? Yeah. Yeah, what do your neighbors say anything to you? Like they just they don't care. Oh, it's pretty cool. I got a privacy fence, and the neighbors on one side of me are pushing 90 years old, and I don't think they can see or hear too well. Yeah. And the others on the other side have a bunch of kids, and they just kind of keep it themselves, and they, they know me, and they just, no big deal. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's that, as long as the community around you is not making a big fuss, you can pretty much do whatever you want. It's, it's, yeah. still, it's still a free country. It <laughs> is, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, I just didn't know if there was any kind of regulations against that, you know, because I've never actually tried it. Or I've never seen anybody do it in the city. There's city or I... and um, what they said is as long as you have a privacy fence up. Oh, okay. All right. They are Kentucky. I mean, even though I'm in an urban area, rural Kentucky, people butcher hogs, people, you know, raise and butcher their own chickens and sheep and goats. It's it's part yeah. of life. And uh there are certain urban areas where there's people who've never been to a farm and they think there should be a law against it, but there's not. So at right. least where I'm at. Now, when you go to places like the UK and Europe, where the nanny state's already been embedded for a few decades, you have to have a license and you have to have a licensed facility to do it. And so like yeah. there are a lot of other places in the world where, yeah, you, you can't do what I do. So yeah. Yeah, the, the closest thing I got, man, is I got actually a live meat market. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you have anything like that down there, but uh, from what I, from what I can see, it's it's pretty rare, man. Like, so this guy opened up this live meat market. You walk in there, one half of it is a huge processing facility, and the other half is this uh, like a barn area where you just pick out your animals. You know, he's got goats and sheep and hogs and and chickens, and um, so you just pick out your animal. And they just drag it out there, and you can actually even kill it yourself. So if it's like if it's part of your religion to mm-hmm. to kill, you know, the animal that you're eating, uh, you can do that. Then they process it right there, and they just send it home with you in bags. About thirty minutes later, man. So that's like the closest thing that I've gotten to <clears throat> um, to getting like actually fresh, you know, processed animal um, and and blood and stuff like that. But um, the only issue with that, man, is I don't know if they're all 100% grass grass raised, you know. I know they supplement some of it with like alfalfa, and yeah. I know that stuff's probably like uh, guaranteed GMO stuff, right? Oh, it's it's hard to find good alfalfa these days. There are yeah. some farmers they'll they'll grow it themselves or come from a local community where you know it's not sprayed or you know it comes from a land that hasn't been uh, adulterated. But yeah, it's a crapshoot, and uh, like I said, it's hard to tell. Like ideally speaking, like hundred years ago. They would fatten up sheep and hog. They'd give them 
a little bit of corn, but this was like organic, you know, farm raised corn. It's not the, the science grown on the moon corn today. And yeah. then they had a little bit of alfalfa. And yeah. they would do that for the last 60 days to get, you know, fat on the frame so that they can take them to slaughter. That, I probably wouldn't have a problem with that as long as you can guarantee that there wasn't any other type of pharmaceutical petrochemical pollution into that. Yeah, like exactly. A hundred years ago, that's the way they would raise them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not the same. <laughs> it just People try to continue that, but they do it with the new GMO ingredients. And it's just, I've seen the, I've seen the scars in the livers. Okay. There's something they call like, like some protein disease where they say they get too much protein, but it's really just the artificial GMO proteins and the, and the soy feed. And it gives them spots, these little spots on their livers. I, I worked at a processing facility. And, yeah. Uh, I did farm slaughter for a company. This old, uh, good old boy had a, a truck. It was an old uh, military truck with a winch on the back of it and a big metal chest. And we'd go out to the farms and we'd drop two cows at a time and process them in the field. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the old timers would do it. Uh, and uh, we'd uh, skin them on the ground and winch them up and quarter them and throw them into the back of this cooler. And so I did this for a summer and I got to see everything. I saw the good, the bad, the ugly. I've seen the best grass fed cows that have just been left out in the field and then I've seen these cows they try to feed on what they call brewers grains they take the wasted grains out of the distilleries around here you know the fermented uh, uh, wheat and barley and all that for the whiskey and then they just fatten these cows on it and these cows by the time they finish eating these grains they they are so fat they can't even walk it, it yeah. they, they have arthritis they're, they're under two years old and they have arthritis in their joints yeah I've seen it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I've also seen the steroids. I saw this one cow we processed and its meat was all spongy. Like I, it, it had the spongy consistency. And I was asking my boss, the guy I was working for, and it's like, what in the world is this? And he's like, oh, it's steroids. It's like, oh my God. And people are still doing that. They have like these hormone pellets they put behind their ears and it makes them want to eat and grow. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and products have the same effect too. You know, they, they say antibiotics, you know, they keep them in the factory farms to keep the animals from getting infected, but it also does something to their appetite. It makes them just eat, 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 eat. And then because they don't get sick right away, they can continue to feed them. And then by the time they're ready to process, that's a sick animal. They might not mm -hmm. be showing signs of it because they butcher them before they're two years old. But if you're to let that animal continue to grow on that trajectory, they would get sick and die. But just when their meat is about the most toxic, that's when they want to process it and feed it to us. Yeah. And so do a, a practice of deworming, chemical deworming about 60 days before process. They say the 60 days is enough time for it to get out of their system. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the idea that our animals have to be chemically dewormed, uh, that's a problem in and of itself. And it's, yeah. it's a whole can of worms, the whole issue, because a lot of <laughs> Literally. Um, yeah, because the farmers have been trained that that's what they have to do. Because yeah. if they don't, half their flock might die. Right. It's and all it's all fear mongering. Yeah. Well, the thing is, they might have to die because your land isn't set up to hold that many animals. And yeah, you're not right. rotating properly. And there's all these things, but it's so much more expensive to fix these environmental issues than it is to just give them a chemical and send them mm -hmm. down the line. And mm -hmm. so. I mean, I, my heart goes out to a lot of people because you can't make money to raise animals in a healthy, ethical way. It's just the, the capitalist system that we have, it, it, it won't allow for it. So to raise the type of meat that we want as raw carnivores, it, it would just bankrupt. And, and we'd have to pay absorbent amounts, which would bankrupt us. But that's where I'm at, though. I have a value system. I'd rather spend, you know, three or $400 on a sheep that's raised properly then mm -hmm. paid one hundred and fifty dollars for a sheep that's you know GMO. Yeah, same here. To, to to fork out that <laughs> that extra cash. Yeah, yeah, same here. A lot of people can't afford it, man. That's yeah, that's exactly what it is. I'm paying like uh, about eight fifty a pound for my grass fed beef right now. You know, well, that's, that's like um, you know, I eat like uh, a couple pounds a day, something like that. You know, so it gets it gets up there, man, with my butter and all that stuff. I'm I'm getting up to about twenty to 25 bucks a day if I'm eating seafood, you know, 
but it's not really terrible, man. Like when I was eating just a standard American diet, you know, I was eating probably 18 to 20 bucks a day, you know? So when I was going through my experimentations, I was getting like organic vegetables and making these Mediterranean dishes with fish and vegetables and you know, asparagus and high dollar organic olive oil. So I was probably spending twice as much as I am. Yeah. Oh, I probably- man, they get you. Yeah, they get you on that stuff. I remember same thing, you know, when I was kind of getting into the whole diet thing and I was still eating vegetables. I remember going to Whole Foods and just trying to buy some organic green beans. And they had this like tiny little package of green beans on the shelf, man. There was like like 10 green beans in there. And I remember it was like six bucks or something. I just couldn't believe how expensive that stuff was. Now so, imagine to feed a family. Now imagine yeah, I, I, exactly. I'm just feeding myself here, man. So, yeah. If I eventually uh, have kids or, you know, get that going, man, I'm going to have to make some make some changes and probably start processing my own food, you know? That's yeah. definitely on the that's definitely on the menu in the future. So, so uh let's see. You know, a big a big thing that people question about is salt, man. What's your opinion on that? Like, do you think that's something that we should be adding or do you think are you are you with the Ogenus Munder Plants camp where salt rocks are supposed to be uh plant food? soil food or uh or do you think um we can get all of our sodium through our food if we keep it raw what's your opinion on that i think you can get most of your salt from food if you keep it raw yeah i've been back and forth on the issue for a while because i'm so i never really salted my food before and i've i've always been you know light on the salt to begin with yeah me too and there was times where i was using salt and I would get like a swelling and just my fluids and I'd feel like, Oh no, there's just too much something in me. And so I don't really salt my meat. I, what I, but I do need electrolytes. I notice I do. And that's where, I mean, a lot of people can't or won't do what I do, but I collect all the blood from the animal and then mm-hmm. I'll bring blood when I can get. It. And I think that helps immensely get, you know, my electrolyte balances. But sometimes when I can't, you know, I'll drink more egg yolks and lemon water, and I've tried to supplement with different things like pinches of salt, and I I even did cook broth for a while, uh, and like it seemed to work, but then long term, like something was wrong with it, it just didn't feel right. Huh? So, yeah. So I've, tried, I've tried many approaches to get the electrolyte issue, and I think it's a huge issue because when people are going through the adaptation process. You're probably used to much higher sodium diets and, and to, yeah. to re because your body will throw extra salt and it takes a while for your adaptation to happen to where your body will actually hold its salts properly. Yeah. And I think that can be a crucial problem, especially not just sodium salts, but a magnesium and potassium and phosphorus and all the mineral salts. So it's really difficult. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't recommend products often. But, yeah, if, if you do seem to have problems, if you're transitioning into the carnivore and you have cramps and stuff, a little bit of magnesium, you know, can help. And a little bit of sodium and potassium. But knowing how much, it, it's, it's up to the individual. And so I'm not really one to say how much somebody should take. There was this uh, woman, uh, I don't know if she was the steak and butter girl, or somebody was recommending this. Uh, it's called... Uh, recharge uh, lmnt it's like a, a mineral it's uh mm-hmm. it's a electrolyte mix that has a uh, let's see sodium potassium and magnesium and like i ordered some of this i've just tried it for the last couple months and actually it seems to hit the spot <laughs> like just <laughs> whatever it is i mix it with water so like, yeah. I'm, you know I, I, and i collect my own spring water too like yeah don't drink reverse osmosis water don't drink extremely filtered water. I go out to the side of a mountain where uh, the Nestle company years ago tried to buy out this place because when they tested it, they said it's about the purest water in the world. And no so the guy didn't sell out. So he has his own little bottling company there, but they have the spigot going. So where you can just go up and I fill up my own jugs. Nice. So spring water, you know, it's a really good thing to think you get all the natural minerals and it's not completely stripped clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah i've struggled with the, the mineral light that is probably one of my biggest struggles on this diet uh, because 
because I sweat and I work hard. And uh, yeah. if you know anything about the human body and the human physiology, we are quite unique creatures. You know, I believe we design ourselves, our evolution designed us to be the persistence hunters. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with the persistence hunt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where uh, they think the most ancient hunting method was as our ancestors would just chase animals down on foot until they mm -hmm. got so tired they'd kill over and then they could smash them with the rock or poke them with the stick. Well, yep. in order for us to be able to outrun large land animals, we had to be able to sweat and, and to dissipate heat and the lactic acid. So we, we dissipate a lot of our minerals and a lot of our electrolytes you know, through physical activity. And so mm -hmm. if you're physically active like I am, in the summer times, I do get extremely depleted. And so there are times cramping and just soreness. And, and it's not like you can just get a salty bag of potato chips and, <laughs> or a gator. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, finding creative ways and, you know, trying to balance that out. And I've tried bone meal, you know, just trying to eat different types of, of natural mineral supplements and, you know, what yep. they take. And so there's a lot of things that you can do as far as balancing electrolytes. And I think it is a major issue. Yeah, uh, it's it's a big point of contention, man. Like, um, you know, there's like basically half the world says you have to have salt. Half the world is like, not half the world, but when you get into nutrition people, mm -hmm. especially people that are doing the raw, like the Hodges Thunder Planets thing, you know, he was totally against salt, you know. But he was very, like, uh, black and white about certain things, but I think there's, like, a lot of nuance, like you're describing there, where it's like, you know, the body can adapt to um, being used to a certain amount of salt coming in, and all of a sudden when you cut it out, I think it, it could throw the, the homeostasis off a little bit or something, you know. So there's, like, there's some details there, I think, that are important. Um, but for the most part, I don't really add salt. I've experimented with it. Um, and I've added it like to my, uh, I do baked potatoes sometimes. It's like the only cooked food that I do. Um, sometimes I'll put it on there, but I don't really notice anything, man. Um, so I don't know, I don't know really what to make of it. So I'm just at this point, I'm just keeping an open mind and I'm not saying that salt is bad or salt is good. I think that's like a false binary anyways. I just think that um, everybody should experiment for themselves, you know, not necessarily trust like a guru on what, what to do about salt. Just experiment for yourself, add some salt, go without salt, see how you feel. Yeah. Um, and like, as far as like the working outside and like sweating and stuff like that, that's, that's what I do too, man. So in the summertime, like I'm sweating a lot. And so, uh, I found myself making the, the raw lemonade. So raw, raw lemon juice, raw honey and, uh, spring water. Right. And I was drinking tons of that stuff last year, man. Like I was drinking like half gallon a day of raw lemonade and that seemed to do the trick as far as like hydration and stuff like that for me personally. Um, but for the most part, like I drink a little bit of water. I do mountain Valley. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Like mountain, mountain Valley. Yeah. Mountain Valley was actually my go-to. Uh, we'd get it at the co-op. They, they sell it at, uh, in glass jugs. Yeah. So that's I, what I get. Yeah. Get it in a five gallon glass jug. Yep. Uh, but then when I found my, my natural spring locally, and uh, yeah. I'm just as good, so I'm uh, loading up for spring. But, yeah, deep aquifers, spring water, stuff that hasn't been touched. Wherever you are locally, wherever you can get that's affordable. There's yeah. a findaspring.com website, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, local. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And so, like, if you're in any local area where you can go harvest your own spring water, I think it's just really good you know, to be able to go out and harvest your own water. And something that you can even take the family, make it an activity where you yep. can know where the water comes from. And because I don't, wouldn't trust the municipal pipes in most places in this country. And so, I mean, I'm not saying it's not good to wash with or you know feed your animals and stuff. But if you really want the best of everything, yeah, go out and find a good clean spring and and, yeah. and strong water. And I, so another, I, I, I was say I found that I found a spring uh, right down the street from me. And uh, on that site, someone sent me that site, and uh, it's right next to a golf course, man. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. You know, just... It's hard to, you got to go, like, I have to drive about an hour, and, yeah. uh, and I get, I have 10 five-gallon jugs, and so I'm actually about out. I need to go on the next day or so, but I'll go about once every month, every, maybe month to six weeks, mm -hmm. and then get about 100 gallons of water. You know, there's a lot for the family for, you know, a month and a half. And that's yeah. it's economical that way because if the local co-op would just buy the, the same spring water, 
It's mm -hmm. eight dollars for a five gallon jug. Yeah. So like okay, so eight times ten, it's eighty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to drive out to get it. So nice, nice. Cost benefit analysis. Yeah. But it's totally worth it. I think it's worth drinking clean water that's not chlorinated and not fluoridated and not doesn't have the runoff from the industrial chemicals. Because I mean, water is our body. It's the primary agent of, of all of life. So you, know, mm -hmm. you can purify mm -hmm. your water, then you can clean up maybe 90% of your yeah. total organism. Yeah, water's dude, water's amazing, man. That's a whole, whole other rabbit hole, man. Just looking into... Uh, um, the research that like Dr. Tom Cowan's done on that. And uh, even that, that book like by Masari Moto, where he's like changing the crystal structures mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, structured water. And then like, you, you know, Gerald Pollock and his fourth phase of water, that stuff, man, really interesting to me, man. Um, uh, yeah. Tom Cowan, I listened to one of his uh, the books on tape and he talks about the intercellular water, how it's actually in a gelatinous form. Exactly. And statically charged membrane that that you know keeps the water in its place and and how mm -hmm. it has to be you know run through this electric charge and if it's not charged properly it can't transfer and all the chemical reactions involved in the body cannot function properly so there's a there's a whole other rabbit hole down down the water hole yeah exactly yeah um so what about all right so I'm sure you got some pretty good insight on um, like parasites, parasites, bacteria, and virus, man. Let's get into that stuff. So germ theory, terrain theory, I'm pretty sure I know where you stand on it already, but um, what's your general opinion on uh, germ theory and terrain theory? Well, as somebody who's not a medical doctor, I don't think we're allowed to have those opinions. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Who but, are we, man? Who are we? But as some crazy person that would you know scream raving on the side of the street if you want to take my advice yeah there's a lot of mythology going around when it comes to bacteria and viruses and parasites it's really we're in the dark ages and we don't realize it because we have all this fancy technology and we say we must be able to understand the underlying principles of life because we have all this fantastic technology right. Right. and it's can't be further from the truth they do not know the underlying fundamental nature of biology and how it works how the genes transcribe themselves to manifest the physical form they don't know how how it actually happens they mm -hmm. strip away the protein that that the proteome that that encodes and wraps around our dna and draws out the traits and interfaces with our environment and then they take this little strand of dna that that's code and say we understand the fundamentals of life and, and it's a total shell game they yeah. have no idea how it works and yeah. so other organisms that live in us and with us are part of our ecosystem are part of the organism that is the earth itself have a purpose have a function and the idea that well if some of them get out of balance and they start producing too much uh, toxic uh, byproducts that start to dissolve our tissues then then it must be the organism's fault and we can blame the organism and if we could only get rid of the organism then we could cure the host and this is just harebrained thinking. It, it's not how it works. These organisms are part of the biological process, you know, from bacterial to viral to parasitic, and they have a function. And I believe that a lot of the, the nematodes and the, the intestinal worms and stuff are actually the immune system of, of the earth. And when grazing animals overrun a certain area, their own toxic uh, bio waste accumulates and it weakens their own immune system and then it allows for them to become susceptible to the nematodes and the worms that are in their droppings and then yeah they'll instinctively say oh yeah this land isn't any better we'll move on allowing the land to heal but mm -hmm. the way farmers do it they fence off their herds and they overpopulate a small portion of land and when their animals start getting sick because they're living in their own waste and, they, and then they find these worms and stuff and these parasites in those animals what they do is they blame the worms and they blame the bacteria and they yeah. the chemical to kill the worms and the bacteria so that the sheep don't die which mm -hmm. worked for so long but genetically it, it, it weakens their own resistance 
And so after generations and generations of this artificial bolstering up of populations, which the earth was never meant to hold, we have a genetically weak populace that could never survive on their own without intense human interference. And so what we go down that rabbit hole, this constant interference, then we're no longer viable. And that the same is true with humans. We, we, you know, from cradle to grave, if we're just dependent upon drug-based therapies and uh, all these medical interventions to keep us alive, it comes to the point where we won't be able to be viable without it. And, and we don't see that these natural things like bacteria and even death, death itself is part of the natural process. If an organism is not viable and cannot sustain itself, death is nature's way of handling the problem. And we can accept that. And it is cruel to, to talk about because it triggers so many people on so many levels when you talk about how some organisms just aren't viable and they're not able to exist in certain environments. And we can't accept it, so we have to do something about it. And I, I agree that there's, there's all types of solutions to these imbalances, but the, the germ theory trope that has been taken to its extreme absurdity in today's world beyond anything that they did back in the days of the, the witchcraft when you know spirits were what was involved in a disease. Well, we've taken it to this extreme absurdity that I, I don't know how to confront because it seems like so many people's minds are made up. All I can do is live by example. I can say, I've been eating raw meat, I've been eating meat that has been rotten, compost, maggots, I take the guts out of these animals and eat them raw with the intestinal juices intact. If bacteria was an issue, wouldn't you think I'd be dead by now? <laughs> exactly. Exactly, man. That's, that's such a powerful testament too, man. And like, the thing is, is not many people are doing that. So that's very like rare to have someone say, hey, you know, I know you believe this and you believe that, but how can you explain I've eaten raw meat for 12 years and uh, I'm not sick, I'm not dead. So, you know, that's yeah. just so simple. You know how they deal with it? They don't talk to me. <laughs> exactly. That's how they deal with that paradox. <clears throat> and I noticed yeah. you had some success. You were on the doctors recently, so that's kind of where I found out about you. Oh, that's, yeah? Yeah, I saw you from the clip. And, uh, okay. It just, it, it kind of irks me because they contacted me years ago uh -huh. and I feel like they didn't really like the cut of my jib and maybe they weren't quite ready for the message, but you know, yeah. the doctors talk a good game, but when it comes to the, the network execs, they, they don't want to give me a platform because I wear so much on my sleeve and I'm so outspoken. No, I, that yeah, I, I totally get that. And I, I admire that about people like you, man, because you're right. And um, right now I'm trying to find the balance between, because I, you know, I, I believe everything that you believe, man. And um, <clears throat> I have some very, you know, what would be considered eccentric ideas to mainstream. And I'm trying to find my, how, my way and how to navigate the social media space, but still sort of get a message out there, but right. not, get ba not get banned, you know? So, yeah. so I basically, I, I just keep my mouth shut for the most part when it comes to, um, you know, all my opinions on, uh, you know, what's going on with the whole world, state of the world today, you could say. Um, and uh, germ theory and <clears throat> stuff like that. <clears throat> I tend to stay away from it because um, they've already threatened my account multiple times. Like YouTube has had me shadow banned years ago, man. And they started unsubscribing people from my channel. And so at about uh, 3,000 followers, I came over to Instagram and I decided to see hey, I wonder if Instagram will be different, you know? I wonder if it'll be uh, any different than YouTube. It's no different. I mean, <clears throat> they, seem like they, they seem to be a little bit more open over here. They kind of let you get away with a little bit more over on Instagram. But they're still doing, like, the shadow banning. And uh, from what I can see, I can't really necessarily prove it, but uh, it seems like a lot of people are getting unfollowed from my channel, you know? Like, I'll look back at my, my statistics, and it's like I'll lose, like, a thousand people over the past six months i'm like why would a thousand people unfollow my channel you know so and i've and i've heard i've had people tell me that yeah instagram is unfollowing my so they've struck my channel multiple times for talking about um you know certain medical procedures inoculations things like that
I've reposted some stuff about that and they've, they've struck my channel. So basically my channel is like always on its last leg. So if they give me one more strike, they could just ban it. So I'm if just I like trying that, to, what? If I said what I felt truly, they probably mm -hmm. ban you for sure. So, I mean, we'll try I, to, we'll try to walk that line. I know. Yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. man. We've got to be like a little strategic about it. And like, I don't think that makes you a pussy, you know, like, even though I kind of feel like a pussy for not speaking my mind a hundred percent, I think that um, there's like a strategy and how to yeah. navigate like the, 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 the evil of this world. Cause I do believe that a lot of this stuff is evil, man. Right. And it's in its true form. So I think to, to fight back against that, you gotta be a little bit strategic about it. So that's kind of where I, where I stand on that. But I agree with you hundred percent on all that stuff, man. Big fan of Tom Cowan. I love how he explains certain things. I like his theories on uh, bioresonance too. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to Tom. I really wish I could get a hold of him. Like if anybody has a way, to send a message out because I mean I'd be a perfect case study for for what he's been talking about because I live and I have, well, I have theories too I have theories that are in line with him about the exosomes and uh, RNA messengers and how that is the missing link to evolution it, it's it's how evolution works yeah. I mean it or not like the placenta of a mammals when they try to test it genetically it's just riddled with what they call retroviruses and i think that they're the method that nature has developed to merge dna of divergent strains of the same organism together it's how it works it's how we maintain genetic viability amongst different organisms in an environment and how we can quickly adapt to environmental changes they have to have a messaging feedback system in place and much of what they're calling you know pathology is really the body of different organisms coordinating immune responses yep. and yeah, it, it's part of the natural cycle and the idea that you can label a part of the natural cycle a disease and then try to eliminate it with uh, artificial means without any understanding of the ramifications yeah it, it's absurd it's absolutely yeah absurd yeah yeah the the, the bioresonance has been the one of the most interesting theories that i ever heard and i think that's that's why i like tom cowan so much man is because he's not afraid to get into like the metaphysical mm -hmm. he's a, a doctor he's very science-based but he gets in he touches into the um the metaphysical and uh, he you know he talks about like rudolf steiner quite a bit i don't know if you've ever looked into that guy but that guy's pretty mind-blowing um but yeah, I think there's a lot of explanations for what's going on in this physical world that can be found in like the um, the metaphysical, you know. And that's yeah. where the that's where the scientists are. They're just blind to that stuff, man. Well, well, not all the scientists, just just the ones that we're exposed to. Like I, I've, I've studied this esoteric uh, battle that's been going on for centuries, and I, you go down the rabbit holes. There's different bifurcations of what they call science. And, you know, the, around the turn of the 1900s, you had these physicists on a materialistic level. They wanted to explain the world as atoms and, you know, protons, <laughs> electrons, neutrons. And this entire model of what they think the world is made out of could mm -hmm. be completely bogus. And there's a lot of other alternative theorists out there. There's a guy, Walter Russell, who coined the term electric universe theory that, you know, no, no, it's everything's light. It's just frequencies of light you have. You know, light, you have gamma, and then past gamma radiation, it transitions into what we call matter. But everything's just a light energy frequency. And this idea that there's a material universe and energy emanates out of the material is just a fallacy. You know, the sun is not a, a nuclear furnace. It's an electromagnetic diode. It emanates electrical magnetic charge. It, it's, it's not this totally nuclear fusion model that they're teaching us so like all these models and when you go back to the models it's just it's just a person's reduction of what they think reality is and they've yeah. been this reductio ad absurdum for generations and despite that our technical knowledge and our technical abilities have been progressing but it's been detached from our conscious awareness our ability to actually understand the nature of the innovations that we are reaching so there's a decoupling of of the technical sciences the inventive geniuses like nikola tesla who promoted the ether theory 
and never really subscribe to the act, the fallacy that electrons are physically transferred. Yeah. <laughs> Perturbations. It's a different type of modality, a different type of cosmology. And mm -hmm. so the, the cosmology of the materialist has prevailed. And for the last hundred years, we've been living under the science. Yeah. And the science is just the same as the word of God or religion or some other dogma. And people mm -hmm. like me and you and others who question it are mm -hmm. we're not burned at the stake anymore. We're just unpersoned on social media. So, like, we have made progress in that respect. We don't get outright burned and murdered and assassinated like we used to. Some of us might, but for the most part, it just, they can't do it. But what they can do is they can silence our voices and they can unperson us. Right. That works. And so we got to find a way. And I believe there's always a way because there's always been people that have been able to see and not all of them are vocal and they work underground. And so yeah. I've been doing that in a way because this is really the first interview I've done in over a year and probably the first interview I've done where we get into more of the metaphysics because mm -hmm. a lot of people in the nutritional realm, you know, just aren't as in tune with, with my metaphysics as you would be. So like we can have this conversation. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Like that's, and that's one thing about, I was going to ask one of my questions was like on my journey specifically, um, as I got into raw meat and things like that, like, and I don't know what caused what if it was chicken or the egg type thing. Um, but I just kind of went through this like huge awakening over the last like five or six years, man. And, uh, like raw meat was just a small part of that. The other stuff that I woke up to was just much heavier and much greater than raw meat, you know? So I think, I think what's going on is that like, you know, I got into the natural food, I cleaned out my body and I got into the raw meat and it helped kind of like tune my body almost, I guess, like a tuning fork to some of like the, the higher frequencies out there, the higher information out there and like the truths that are available out there. And I was able to kind of receive that stuff a little bit more over the last five or six years, man. And that's what kind of got me into more of like the metaphysical world and, and, and things like that and kind of explaining what's going on through that stuff. But I was going to ask you if you noticed that as you started to clean up your diet, if you noticed that you started to kind of uh, awaken up to like, you know, greater things and stuff that you hadn't realized before. Or was yep. it all, do you think, just all one big like transition that you went through? Yeah, metamorphosis. And yeah, yeah right. I was yeah. the person I am. And so, yeah, it's a constant growth. And I think as human beings, that, that's what we are designed to do. We're designed to constantly grow and to learn. And we, we have an expanded lifespan compared to a lot of other animals because it gives us that advantage, the advantage of grandparents. You know, once you reach a certain age and you've raised your offspring, you still have wisdom and you still have many of years of life. So, like, I think it gives us an advantage able to to develop more slowly and over a longer period of time. And then we can transfer that knowledge back to the other generations, out to the ages even. You know, there's wisdom. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so this is the culmination of millions and millions of generations of struggle and strife. And, and progress doesn't happen like a walk in the park, you know, just a walking through the fields and clovers and and sunshine it is a struggle and desperation is the father of invention and so many many desperate generations of people struggling with life problems have culminated into what we consider the wisdom of ages and so i like to cultivate that and i want to be a stepping stone and so when i started going through my clarity and i came from a very foggy background i think i had heavy metal poisoning i was a commercial electrician i had a lot of uh, toxic syndromes that I think were actually environmental poisoning. And mm -hmm. since they don't acknowledge environmental poisoning exists, they just want to put a label. So I had a lot of brain fog. I had a lot of emotional yeah. uh, imbalances and, and really just uh, negative feelings. Just a feeling of hopelessness. Like yeah. I'm going to die a crazy SOB and nobody <laughs> is going to give a damn. And so you mm -hmm. go through that type of uh, despondency. And then when you come out of it, oh, my God, it, it just, it, it changed me. It, wanted, it made me want to go out and just praise, praise the Lord and preach the gospel. And then uh, 
Well, then you realize that there's a world out there that's very cold and very mm -hmm. dead to it and that you got to be careful because these people are very dangerous yeah. and many levels. <laughs> and so they've, it's always been suppressed, you know, when people wake up to it. And so yeah. I try to see myself as a, a little guide, not, not the guru, not somebody who's going to tell you I have all the answers and just, you know, explore, fathom, follow your curiosity, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's led me down many different ways of living and thinking that I could never have imagined before, you know, going completely raw meat. And yeah. uh, this evolutionary lifestyle that I believe that we could bring forth to this day and age, because during the million year or so period where they say our brain size doubled, you know, from early hominids, yeah. I believe we were living this way. I believe that raw meat-based diets were probably the staple around the time, and that gave us the ketogenic metabolism where we were living off the megafauna fat and the, and the fish and the shellfish and all these other, you know, raw animal foods. I think it's really what fueled our evolution to begin with. And mm -hmm. so I think that if enough of us can revert back to that evolutionary diet, it can fuel the next phase. Yep. And it can fuel the phase of a bright, strong, independent humanity. And there's another force out there that's saying, no, no, too many very strong, intelligent people are dangerous. And that's true, too, right? to a certain extent. So there's a controlling mm -hmm. faction out there that believe that, no, no, the peasants need to be kept impish and small and, and impotent. And so we need to find a plant-based diet to feed them. They, they might be able to get a little bit of cricket protein every now and then. <laughs> definitely not to the point where they're super geniuses, because heaven forbid you have a population of people with extremely high IQs and physical strength, because they'll take over the world. Yeah. And so there's that fear mentality, that people who are well-fed, well-nourished, and well-educated are uncontrollable, the American yeah. Revolution. And, and they are, to a certain extent. But mm -hmm. that is our birthright. And I feel like there's a faction out there trying to take that away and trying to prevent people like me from being able to source my own food and to live in accordance to my own nature. And so there's a conflict. And yeah. The battle is going to ensue, and we are on the forefront of it right now. For sure. Man, yeah, you're dropping some knowledge, buddy. Yeah, so, you know, and I, it's interesting that you say that because, like, I think most people just, you know, at first glance probably wouldn't think that, uh, you know, until you get to talk to us that you and I would have these uh, insights or opinions about what's going on in the world, you know. But, like, you know, human beings, I think, are amazing people, man. We're capable of seeing the truth for what it is, you know, and they can try to hide it all they want, but – we're going to eventually see through it, you know, and they can try to hide it from um, generations of people, but eventually the younger generations are going to wake up to it as well. And like, I think it's so profound what you were saying earlier about how this is like, this is what's been going on for like thousands of years. Like this is the whole, what I like to say is like, this is the game of life that we're in, man, is that they are trying to hide the truth and we're being fed lies and we're given information that's not correct and we're being told to go out into the world and live with it and then the whole thing is waking up to that and then realizing what the truth actually is and then looking back through history and realizing like 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 that's that's what's been going on for thousands of years and my favorite example of that is and i'm, and I'm not like a huge uh religious guy or dogmatic guy but my favorite example of that is jesus man and i think that's why that guy is like the most famous he's the most famous dude of all time why do you think that is, right? Look at what he was doing. That guy was like just trying to drop truth, you know? If you can look past all the things that like people saying that like, you know, he was God or whatever. If you just look at him as a human being, that guy was just trying to drop knowledge basically. And people were, um, you know, they nailed him to a cross for it, if you believe that. So it's interesting, man. It's just, it blows my mind once I made that connection. I was like, oh, that's why Jesus is so famous. Like it has, it's the same exact thing that's going on today. Like they're trying to suppress the truth. They're trying to suppress information. And that's what's been going on since the beginning of time. And it's like, that is like, that's like the whole game. And the whole game is it's trying to navigate those, those waters between truth and lies um, without going insane, basically, or without climbing the clock tower. Right. And so, it, it, it will drive you to that edge. And that's the key to not let it break you. <laughs> Yep. And so I've, yep. I've been 
close to the edge before and, and I'm on a path right now that's going to lead me to the cross. You know, I'm going to put myself up there. And all I can say is hope the angels in heaven are watching. And I believe that they've guided me. And I believe that they guide many people if you're open to it. And so let justice be done, may the heavens fall. But you have to go into these things with eyes wide open. You have to realize that there is a certain amount of pain in life and that when you open yourself up and really express who you are and let that light shine, you're, you're making yourself a target and you're making yourself vulnerable. And yeah. so you have to know there will be consequences. And the farther and farther you go and the harder and harder you fight, the more pushback you're going to get. And yeah. so... I mean, this is a game of life, and this is what we're all playing right now. Maybe this is our purpose and our challenge in life. Mm -hmm. And so that's what life is. It, it's, it's, it's a challenge, and it's self-replicating, and it, it engineers solutions to problems as things evolve. And so we're at this phase, and this phase is going to determine you know, the future of our evolution as a species. Are we going to be a genetically modified cybernetic organism or are we going to be an organic, holistic, <laughs> heirloom variety? I'm a person who believes we should be able to coexist. It's like, okay, go ahead and frontier that science, and, and let's see how the cyborg people do after a generation. The right. idea that we need to put everybody into one basket and ship them all off into one experiment at once seems absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we can't. Uh, mitigate risk by just having okay a control population and then an experimental group and then a you know people who want to live one way or people who want to live another and then let's let's let the scientific method work and it, but in the meantime smell the freaking roses enjoy this earth this, this place this life is a gift there should be no hurry to transhumanate like we have hundreds of years this idea that the earth's going to run out of energy or the climate's going to blow up and and all of this is alarmist. I believe we have time to take a deep breath, to contemplate the beauty, and to live our lives. And yes, work towards sustainable solutions for a better tomorrow, but not at this maniacal breakneck speed where we have to do it now, or it's do or die. You do this or, or else you don't, aren't allowed basic freedoms. This is just a, a maniac in control over the runaway train. And, yep. and like a Bonhoeffer said, if you're riding next to a maniac who's going to head towards a crowd of people, you have a moral obligation to grab that wheel and turn it and mm -hmm. keep them from riding into innocent people, whatever, even if you put yourself in harm's way. And mm -hmm. so that's our moral obligation. Anybody who understands what's going on has a moral obligation to do something. Yep. Now, whether or not they hear that calling or not, it's a personal choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking the truth, man. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I get off on the tangent of religion. No, it's great. It's great, man. It's great. It's beautiful. Um, so do you got like any plans to ever come back to social media? Or are you just kind of staying, staying in the, uh, in the background right now? I have to stay in the background right now. I have four small children yeah. and I'm in a legal battle against the state and like I said, I'm going to put the word out there who I am in the undercurrent. And I'm going to allow, if anything ever happens to me, that my words will be a testament. Like, I'm not planning on harming myself or anybody else. I am try to be a good human being. I'm flawed. I make mistakes. i over-idealistic. I wear my heart and my passions on my sleeve. So that makes me a huge target in today's society. <laughs> woke, woke culture would just eviscerate yep. me if I try to put my head up too high. Yep. So I'm just going to come in the undercurrent, and I like talking to people on a small, down, low level. And like yeah. I said, if we don't hit super high in the algorithm and we don't get millions and millions of views, hopefully they, they'll allow this to stay up and we'll be able to get the message out to other like-minded people. Yeah. I hope so, man. Yeah, I'm still, I mean, I'm still fairly, like, small channel, so... We're still kind of still under the radar, which I prefer that, man. I don't know if I could really handle a big channel. You know, I don't think that's really my thing. I kind of like to, I like my privacy still a little bit. I'm not, I never was like a huge social media guy at all before, before like this raw meat thing. I just felt like it was my duty to kind of start up this channel to show people 
like this like transformed my health and my life so i was like i have to show people this you know so the only that's the only reason i made this channel man when i just you know i'm just trying to just keep it on the tracks and keep things going and you know get some interesting people uh to talk about this stuff with you know but um <clears throat> so all right man so i got a couple questions about let's see let's go back to food a little bit here so what is um like how many pounds of meat do you eat per day that's something that i'm trying to figure out what's the ideal amount of meat to eat per day it depends on how much i work okay so you go that's with you go with the flow energy out like you know if you can imagine paleolithic days when they made a major kill and then they had to haul the pieces of the animal back to the the camp encampment you know mm -hmm. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Maybe they had little drag-alongs. Maybe they had some pack animals at certain times. But think of the amount of caloric effort it would take to gather a lifestyle. You know, yeah. we're talking three, four, five thousand calories a day. Mm -hmm. That's killing. But our lives are a lot easier. So, you know, I'd probably about two a day. Maybe. Two pounds? Yeah. Okay. And like I said, I'm, I'm six foot tall, 100 and... 85 pounds so you know you, i have a bigger frame and a more active lifestyle so it just depends on who you are how active you are what your metabolism is doing and some days you know i'm couch potato i lay around i might not eat as much and then other days especially like after a fresh kill and i haven't been eating for a while and i feel a little depleted you know you, it's that binge and purge cycle you know Agenis talks about it you know building up the fat reserves and using that as a cleanse to fast out and yep. so that's part of the natural cycle as well that we've been decoupled from we don't yep. allow ourselves to get too hungry these days and we don't allow our natural appetite and instinctive uh, nutrition habits to form because we mm -hmm. form our habits around the clock oh it's eight o'clock i gotta get up and eat breakfast oh right. i gotta have my lunch break oh it's yeah. dinner time. <laughs> and so yep. part of the diet has been liberating from all of that because i wake up in the morning and i don't really feel very hungry and uh, I might eat a little, let's drink an egg yolk and drink some lemon water just to get hydrated for the day. And then maybe sometime around mid-morning, I'll eat, you know, maybe a half a pound of meat and, you know, some fat bites and pieces of organs, just a small meal in the middle, early part of the day. And then I might not eat again till dinner time, or if I eat, it'll just be a little snack, grace throughout the day. And then dinner time is usually the time where I'll, I'll get a huge plate of meat and I'll just pile a portion of fat and a portion of uh, red meat and some organs. And then I'll eat according to instinct. And I, it's not about eating all those foods on the plate. I'll just eat. And then there'll be that instinctive stop. It'll, it'll tell me when, like when yeah. I've had. And so it might be a pound, you know, a pound and a half in the evenings. And then, you know, I'll feel that stop and I'll say, okay, I'm pretty satiated. <laughs> and then I'll put yeah. a little and there's no effort it's not rocket science it just seems to yeah. be you eliminate all those artificial ingredients all those uh like msg and and, and the extra salts and the flavor additives and and the cooked proteins also act as a, a disruptor you know the cooked mm -hmm. uh, proteins and meat they can act like as an opiate in the brain and can trigger you to mm -hmm. go through these hunger cycles and tend to make you overeat but in the raw state when you're acclimated to it and you're instinctively uh, attuned to the taste and, and and the portions like i need this much fat i need this much protein and you just do it without thinking so like without thinking for years and so i don't even measure way sometimes i put like a pound and a half in a bag like when I trap go down to Florida once a year of, of meat, and then I'll have like for each day I'll make sure I have at least a pound and a half, and then yeah. I eat some seafood and other stuff while I'm down there. So like I try to ration things out so I know for sure I don't go without. But if I don't even eat that half pound and a half because maybe I found a good fish store and I got a you know big <laughs> chunk of fish or some shellfish and or I've just been out at the beach all day laying on the beach soaking up the sun and <laughs> having a good time yeah so got, it doesn't matter like how much i eat every day it just seems to be something that happens <laughs> right 
Yeah, interesting, man. I'm, I'm trying to get there myself. Like, I seem to be right around a pound and a half to two pounds a day is kind of where I'm at. Um, and I'm trying to get to the point to where, like, I can do that, where I can just eat. Um, binge and purge uh, is something that I'm also naturally doing and I kind of fell into as I got into the diet, which is interesting. So I'll put on a bunch of weight and then I'll kind of drop the weight, put on a bunch of weight, drop the weight. And uh, when I get up to, um, I can get up to like probably about 210 and uh, I start to feel like I'm just not hungry anymore, man. Like I'm almost uh, like, I just don't want me, not that I'm like repulsed by it, but it just doesn't sound good. So that's when I know it's time to <clears throat> cut my meals down, maybe start doing a little intermittent fasting or, or even fasting for like a day or two when I realize that I just don't want meat anymore. It doesn't sound good. So then I'll just drop some weight from there. And I, dude, I, it's so funny you say that because that's what I've been naturally doing, you know, just kind of naturally fell into that. And then also I think a big thing that people miss is uh, like seasonal eating. So um, like, I think that we would have, you know, if people are into dairy, they would have probably drank more milk in the spring and summer, you know, when the grass is lush and the nutrients are dense and then um, probably made cheese and butter for the winter to kind of get them through the winter. And then also uh, eating fruit in the season. I don't, do you eat fruit at all? Uh, besides lemons, I, I eat coconut. I'll eat coconut butter. So that's, I mean, yeah. I'll, you eat potatoes for a little bit of starch. I think uh, yeah. coconut butter, it's, it's, it's a pureed coconut. It's, it's just whole mm -hmm. coconut. And it has enough, a little bit of fiber for the resistant starch and a little bit of low glycemic carbs. Yeah. So I'll eat coconut butter and lemons. And then every once in a great while, I might just have a salad, but I don't really have any inclination for it. It's just you don't. interesting. Oh, yeah. I, the, um, I've noticed the lemons or the limes that I've been doing. It, it seems to satiate me with and a little bit of coconut. It helps me increase my appetite. Like if I'm pure carnivore and I don't eat any carb at all, then yeah, I, I get real lean. Like, you know, I'm about 185 now, but. Yeah. You know, if I don't eat any carb, I'm, I stay around 170. So uh -huh. I, know I balance it out. If I have a little bit of low glycemic carb, it mm -hmm. helps me keep a little, little bit more weight. And so, and the eggs too, off, you know, often help with that. So, and like I said, I feel more, I feel more optimal if I'm a little, got a little more weight on me. I don't know if it's just happy fat or what, but if I'm too, um, lean, you know, if I'm too lean and my fat index goes down too much, you know, I just don't feel as well i don't have as much even headed energy throughout the day right. yeah <clears throat> exactly man that's exactly how i feel and then you know but it kind of fluctuates like it's it's not like a uh one's good or one's bad type thing for me like i'll put on a bunch of weight and i'll be like you know what? i feel pretty good with a little bit of fat on me and then i'll lose that weight and i'll have it's almost like a different type of feeling but i still feel good like um it's yeah. almost like the difference between like you feel good when you're eating well and you're eating like uh, a bunch of food throughout the day and you're just, you got a bunch of weight on you. But I also feel really, really good when I fast. Right. Yeah. So it's like, there's not, it's not like I feel good when I eat and I feel bad when I fast. It's two different, two different uh, mind states almost, man. You know, <laughs> one is like, uh, one is like more of a content, relaxed and content. And then while I'm fasting, I have more of like a, uh, more of like a, a focused and alert, I guess, you know? So, which is, they can both be beneficial mind states, I think, you know, depending on what you're doing. And I think everything is, life is all about undulating, right? It's all about just up and down, up and down, never sticking with one thing or the other. So I think, you know, I just constantly uh, undulating between fasting and eating and um, experimenting with those mind states of feeling relaxed and content and also focused and alert and just kind of bouncing back between all those. Um, as far as carbs go, like I kind of bounce back and forth with carbs. I'll eat potatoes. I'll eat like a, one potato a day for like a few weeks and then I'll quit potatoes for a couple months and I'll do the same thing with milk. I'll, uh, I'll cycle milk on and off. So I'll just, I'll drink milk for like a month or two. And then I just won't drink milk for like six months, you know? So like I always, I just kind of cycle things in and out. And that seems to be like what's worked best for me personally, just doing that. And that, that's where I'm at, too. I mean, I, you're, you're right on. It's it's an instinctive approach. You, you feel it if you've had too much. And sometimes it's not necessarily what you're eating or the, the quality. My animals' quality shifts so much 
And so sometimes I'll be eating a lot of an animal, but maybe the animal's not that optimal and I'll just feel bad with it. So I just won't eat as much and I'll instinctively mm -hmm. fast and look for something else. Well, and yeah. then get that fresh animal that I really like, I'll gorge myself on it to build my reserves up. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'll reach that certain point of saying, okay, I think I've built up enough. And so, yeah, that instinct that we're naturally regulated. I mean, we regulate things naturally yeah. if we're following a natural way of life. So yeah, the idea that so many people struggle so hard, and I well, just... yeah, I think it's we've become such an over intellectualized society, man. Like everything has become intellectualized, and it's not all about kind of like following your spirit or following your intuitions. And I think that's what it is: is everybody wants to, they want to read a book, or they want to listen to a podcast, and they want them to tell tell you what to eat, you know. But it's like, and that's what I try to do, man, is I try not to like get too lost in the weeds with like nutrition facts and nutrition data and like the latest research on how vitamin D interacts with the enzymes in your body. Like I, that stuff like bores the hell out of me, man. Like all the, I hate it, dude. And so I try to just focus on like the more intuitive aspect of nutrition, you know, and just like, hey man, I can't necessarily tell you guys like how vitamin D synthesizes inside of the neural pathways in your brain or whatever. But, you know, I can show you guys what I'm doing and I can show you, you know, this is what I do and this is how it works for me. And if you want to try to mimic that and duplicate it and see if it works for you, that's all I can really do, man. But yeah, I just, I think when you try to steer people too much, they start to become too intellectual and they start to get disconnected from their spirit and it just, everything gets out of whack, man. And they can't possibly know all the experiences and all the other uh, variables that you go through in life. So if you make a recommendation to somebody and they get food from a completely different source and they have a completely different metabolism, nothing ever syncs up exactly. So, yeah, yeah. you can never really tell. And I went through the minutia of research, like you were saying, and it's like, oh, yeah, the vitamin D synthesized in your skin with uh, ultraviolet light reacting to uh, bacteria. Right. You go through all the all that and yeah. like wow, life extremely complicated. And then you make a life extremely complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of just saying like, I'll oh, go out and get some fresh air and sunshine. <laughs> exactly. Water. Find yeah. some cool people to hang out with and you know, this live the sim simplicity. I mean it's key and yep. this is what I've tried to find and it's it's hard. The world is complicated and it seems to be getting more so. So when you're trying to step back from it it is it is difficult to simplify and to really just let the mind be cool with not knowing letting the mystery you know wash over your consciousness and just follow your instinct and trust your instinct that's even harder for a lot of people to do because no no i've read in the book that raw meat will kill you mm -hmm. so they can't even let go because they've been taught wrong and so false knowledge is really a problem of this day and age this yep. information it is the curse. Yeah, <laughs> it totally is, man. Um, so let's see. I got a couple more questions for you, man. We can wrap it up. Uh, what do you kids eat raw too? Uh, now they eat different things. Some raw, some not. Like uh, two of my daughters really like sushi. One of my daughters will like uh, raw liver and uh, raw eggs. And my yeah. son was a little older when I transitioned, so he never really got into the raw. But he likes really rare steaks. Yeah. And so, yeah, they don't eat raw. They eat, I try to gear them more towards a cooked Western Price style diet. And yeah. their family and the rest of the people kind of do their own thing. So I don't yeah. have 100% control or input, nor do I want it, because I don't have enough time in the day to fight <laughs> all right. the shit. Because it's everywhere. Yeah. Like Everywhere they go, kids these days are just... They're fed processed foods. It's just a matter of course. You know, the adults will have their meals and the kids will have the kid meals. <laughs> it's just yeah. so divorced from that traditional, you know, everybody at one big table eating off the same dishes uh, yeah. lifestyle that may have existed, you know, in tradi more traditional days. No, no, we're in fast food culture world and it's it's hard. Uh, yeah. My girlfriend helps. We've been looking like different types of uh, new keto. There's a lot of cooked keto stuff out there and low carb recipes that are life changing mm -hmm. for a lot of people who aren't willing or able to go raw even. You know, people, yeah. you know, go the cooked keto route and there's better ways to do that, you know, as well if you're 
you're not totally into raw meat or if you're just wanting to do a little bit of raw, you don't have to do 100%. It's yeah. not an all or nothing uh, proposal. You can find really nourishing raw foods that you like and tolerate and incorporate that into a mixed diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, man. Um, so let's see. Oh, do you, when you sleep at night, do you dream? Do you dream every night? Uh, I don't dream every night. I have, I go through phases where I'll dream. And okay. So, and then some dreams, some dreams are innocuous and some dreams are these twisted journeys that just seem to take me across different worlds and yeah. we seeking some, some unattainable goal. <laughs> they just yeah. out over landscapes. It's almost like the nomadic uh, dreamscape where you're just trying to find your home or trying to find that place, that lost paradise. And so I go through a lot of that. Like last night, actually, I remember I was hunting for these uh, indigenous birds. Like, And they weren't like any birds I've ever seen. They're like peacocks with like little velociraptor beaks. And they <laughs> it's primordial. <laughs> These primordial, and I just wanted the feathers because, like, I could make a really cool headdress with those feathers. I don't even yeah. wear a headdress, but I wanted, <laughs> so I wanted to fight, find these birds of paradise and, you know, hunt them, eat their meat, and make feathers. And I don't know if it's an ancestral memory or if it's something I saw on a documentary. <laughs> just, yeah. But, yeah, these types of dreams, you know, seem to come and go. And, and some of them are really enlightening. Some of them are frightening. So... Do you, uh, have you ever noticed, um, after you eat like raw brains that it gives you intense dreams at night? Oh yeah, I, totally. I mean, that's, that's the type of dreams I'm telling you about. I didn't eat raw brains last night, but, uh, yeah, I have those really intense lingering on the verge of lucid, but not quite. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, they're lucid, almost like psychedelic dreams, man. Yeah. yeah the vividness of the dreams, almost like the vision of it. Yes. Yes. The end of the animal, or is it the, the, the flush of a DHA and fatty acids that just are fueling the, the regeneration of our own neurotransmitters? I don't know. There's no speculation involved. Man, that, it, that intrigues the hell out of me, man. Because I know that, like, almost, I mean, a lot of people I talk to have the same experiences. And I know there's no research on that ever, that's ever been done. They can't. They can't do that. that they research. can't. There's no research on it, man. So it's like we are the, we are the people researching it right now, and it's like the only only thing we can do is just kind of speculate. You know, is it because we're eating raw neurotransmitters? You know, is it because we're eating like the the pineal gland? You know, and that's influencing our dream states somehow. Um, you know, it's just it's just so mind blowing to me, man, because it happens every time I eat brains. But um, I have pretty vivid dreams as it is. Um, and I also sleep in a Faraday cage. I don't know if are you uh, are you into like the EMF stuff? Uh, I am. I'm highly concerned about it, but I'm also like, how the hell am I going to avoid it? And there's also people who say like, if you sleep in a complete Faraday cage and you don't have any resonance energy of the Earth, then that can actually be detrimental as well. Interesting. So maybe no. partial. Shielding, maybe just shield yourself from above, from the radio towers and stuff, and then still ground to the earth. Yeah. Right, sure. So, a lot of Faraday cages are built like that. So. Yeah, like, I actually, <laughs> I actually use a uh, a grounding sheet. Uh huh. So I don't know if that's what you're talking about, yeah. like just actually like grounding yourself. But yeah, I sleep on a grounding sheet, and then I built like a, uh, a homemade cage at a window screen, and I also sleep next to uh, a bag of Tesla crystals. Because uh -huh. I started like, it's funny, man, this whole journey I've been on, I was like convinced like s probably six years ago that anybody that talked about magic crystals was like a schizophrenic. I was, I was convinced. I was like, these guys are freaking crazy. You know, never, never, never date a girl that's into magic crystals. That was my whole thing. And um, then, uh, my children, actually. Yeah, she's pushing crystals on my kids. and <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude so i mean it can be kind of annoying when people are like really into it but i just kind of dabbled in it because i learned about these tesla crystals that i got off of emfrocks.com and they just kind of hit me at the right time when i was really into emf and i got my own emf detector and i kind of went down this whole emf rabbit hole and actually i wear this uh emf shirt every single day um underneath my hoodies and stuff so i'm i'm shielded 
But I'm not like paranoid about it, but I'm like, hey, man, you know, I know it's true. I read the book Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, and that like totally changed my life about electricity. So I started just doing everything I could. But I found that uh, when I'm in an EMF free environment, like, for instance, if I'm in my basement, which is like lined with cinder block, and I sleep in the corner of my basement, I get the most intense deep sleep of all time. And so I moved out of my basement, I built this cage, and it basically mimicked my basement. And I get some of the best sleep ever. Yeah, yeah I get some of the best sleep ever in those cages. So it's just something that I discovered over pretty recent, man, over the past year. But it first happened about three years ago when I shut off my Wi Fi. Um, I just read it online or something. Someone said, Hey, Wi Fi can you know, interrupt your uh, sleep patterns, your melatonin production, blah, blah. So I shut my Wi-Fi off for one night. And I swear it wasn't like placebo or it wasn't like imaginary. The next morning I woke up and I felt like it was just like everything was like quieter. Like almost like my mind was more quiet or like there was less chatter or something was going on. But I just felt like it was just like it was more peaceful somehow. It was very subtle, but I noticed it. Um, and so I just kind of ran with it from there. And a couple years later, I got into the Faraday cages and stuff. So, yeah, there's, I mean, years ago, I was, a, I was a total skeptic and I didn't believe in anything new age. And I'm, actually, it was more atheistic when I was a younger human being. And so I just didn't buy into any of that. And then, yeah, changes happen. I met a lot of people through the raw paleo sites. Uh, some of them, this one lady, she follows Jack Cruz. She actually went on a Jack Cruz cruise. He's a, have you heard of him? You know, I've heard his name, but I don't know what he does. He, he's a neuro, uh, one of those neurosurgeons that's, you know, talks about the EMFs, but also talks about the circadian rhythms and how they, you know, naturally. So they're, they're about turning the lights off at a certain time, you know, just using the red frequency light. I have a red light therapy machine. Are you familiar with those? I actually, yeah, I actually have, uh, I have just a bulb, just a small bulb. <laughs> No, 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 no. I got, I got a huge panel. It's like the Coos. It's got you know, oh, dude. 1,500 watts. And so, yeah, definitely there's certain to the energy healing. I do feel, and I was using the red light machines for years because this lady that I knew that owned a tan bed salon, she just had one and uh, she just offered it to me and I started, I was using it years ago and I noticed the benefits, you know, immediately. I just feel so much more relaxed with mm -hmm. it and a uh, and the theory, too, about uh, the Wi-Fi, I've heard it also say that, see, we have the pineal gland and we have a sensory perception deep within our brain, maybe where we evolved as primordial crustaceans or something to sense the differences in the light and the, the electromagnetic frequencies of the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, they, that the, the Wi-Fi mimic that. So throughout our dream states, if we're getting hit with the Wi-Fi radiation, it t tells the brain to, hey, hey, the sun's getting ready to come up, and then it keeps you from actually getting into the deeper, restful states of sleep so you don't yep. fool rejuvenate. And some yep. people are more sensitive to that than others. And so yeah. I know a lot of people who are and claim to be highly sensitive, and maybe that's part of my problem as an electrician. I've been hit with voltages so much that, you know, I'm probably permanently uh, altered because <laughs> I'm... <laughs> you know, high voltage and I get hit, you know, I used to get hit more regularly and not, not so much anymore. I'm more careful. Yeah. I wear rubber gloves, but yeah, there's, there's definitely something to this electronic world we live in and the electric universe is real and they permeate us, all these energies and with the star Wars and all this new space force technology and the five G's and all that, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. And so I think precaution is warranted and yeah trying to mitigate maybe not eliminate all exposure to you know external radiation as is, is possible but yeah you can yeah. definitely shield yourself especially when you're sleeping at night <laughs> yeah yeah when you're sleeping you know and like that's like such a cool side effect of it is you can just get better sleep and then uh i also got like an ethernet cable for my phone so when i'm like just sitting on my couch relaxing at night when everybody's you know getting off work and like messing with their phones and stuff <laughs> I got it on airplane mode and I just got an ethernet cord run into my router. So I'm not even using my internet or anything. And, and, uh, it's not, you know, radiating me, but, uh, I usually always have my phone on airplane mode when it's in my pocket and stuff like that. It's just, you know, I just figure anything could help, you know, especially now that I'm aware of it. 
Yeah, I try to leave my phone in my car when I'm working and, like, not keep it on me at all times. And that way, just mitigate where you can. Yeah. Like, just hope and pray that, you know, we have a a little bit of resilience. Because a little bit of the radiation, honestly, maybe it's what we are and who we are. Because the sun has an electromagnetic (laughs) radiation emerging Mm -hmm. magnetic field. So, I mean, we're constantly barraged, and it's what we are. We're electromagnetic radiation beings. Mm -hmm. It's just what intensity and have we been able to adapt and to evolve and some of these things that they think are viral i think they're actually the body's way of mitigating uh radiation damage yeah like and repairing the double helix when it is damaged and sometimes enough cells are damaged in sequence they initiate a repair cycle and so we have an innate healing ability to mitigate a lot of this stuff yeah you know i fall asleep next to these electric baseboard heaters and and I heard people who are in the kitchens with the electric ovens have, you know, lower sperm counts. And so there's, yeah. there's all this anecdotal evidence that we've been exposed to it, and yet somehow we've been able to mutate and to adapt. So maybe that's the trajectory we're on. Uh, yeah. But we, we should proceed with caution. You know, I don't say, that, you know, we should all just start microwaving ourselves 24-7. Um, <laughs> let's proceed with caution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, man. That was um, that was a really interesting conversation, dude. And I appreciate you coming on, man. That was, uh, that was a lot of excellent information. You're a really interesting guy. And uh, I think you got a lot of good stuff to talk about, man. So I think you should put yourself out there a little bit more, you know, if, if possible. But, you know, we'll see. We'll There'll, try be to, uh... There'll be time for that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. We got plenty of time such a busy lifestyle I, I have four kids i work as an electrician yeah. i have this holistic lifestyle i'm trying to support and then on top of that i'm fighting a local revolution but there's just so much going on and honestly i don't have a lot of people you know close to me that are, are completely in line with what i feel and there's a lot of people that i've known from the forums that have just drifted off like people mm-hmm. i've been in contact with and so and I'm kind of out here in no man's land. So it's just good to hear other people of like minds. And yeah, I'll try sure. to reach out and maybe we'll keep in contact and do yeah. some other. For sure, man. Yeah. And like, um, obviously, if you're ever in the Nebraska area, dude, you always, uh, you know, you can come over, have a steak or whatever. We can hang out. And uh, um, some people are asking already, too, but is there a way that people can contact you in any way that you want to put out there or no? I mean, Facebook Messenger, like I'll check the Facebook and okay. I don't care if the, if the government spies on me because I think they've been watching me for a long time anyway. So, yeah, <laughs> but they send me a message and I, I can't respond to everything, but, you know, okay. I, I, if you have a worry or just a question, yeah, I'll, I'll try to get to it if anybody has any questions. Okay. And that's that's uh, Derek Nance on Facebook, right? Mm-hmm. That's uh, Derek and then N-A-N-C-E, guys, so if you guys want to get a hold of them. <clears throat> sweet man that was really cool dude i appreciate it and uh i think we should definitely do this again sometime here yeah yeah we can check in sometime and that way uh, i need a media li- liaison and i probably need a public relations handler i just i don't trust people <laughs> there's so many people in the business that are so shady and i've talked to so many producers that <clears throat> promised me and did i've done skype interviews with uh, producers for casting calls and then all of a sudden they find out truly who I am and what I'm about and they never <laughs> so I've been kind of dated about media appearances and trying to yeah. put myself out there too much. I think that there is a dark entity that doesn't want a lot of this discussed out in the broader audience. So I like yeah. to be able to just stay in the grassroots and uh, sure. camouflaged. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing, man. That's that's where the real work is, you know what I mean? So yeah, and you too. Like, I'm glad that you hopped on board. You hopped on board a little later in life than me, but <laughs> I think that you're probably right on par where where I was three years into it. And so, like, yeah, just keep keep running with it. I will, man. I will. I have no plans on changing at all. So, It'll be interesting to see what we all look like when we're like 15, 60 years old, right? Yeah. Well, that's it. It's a living experiment. Like, I'm all about the scientific process and let it play out. And, I wish, for the love of God, there would be a raw meat-based study. There's a couple carnivore studies, I think, that are tentatively being played out. I think there might be a 
study, but it's yeah. not really, they're not nearly the type of funding that needs to go into it. I talked to Dr. Russ, uh, Lustig, he, he, Robert Lustig, he like one of these insulin resistance doctors out of Stanford. I was mm -hmm. telling him about my diet and tell him what I did. And he's like, I believe you, but there's just no grant money for any such study. And he's a clinical yeah. researcher. Like I've talked to him, I've tried to reach out to him and they're like, yeah, you're probably right, but we, we couldn't possibly run one of these studies through our university. The insurance and liability and all these uh, red tapes yeah. go through. So the science is shackled, whatever they call the science. It's, 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 imagine you have a bunch of Einsteins on a dog leash and a choke collar and that choke collar is being <laughs> cut by Mr. Moneybags. Yeah. So Mr. Moneybags doesn't want Einstein to investigate then the Einstein is not going to investigate. Isn't it crazy? It's crazy. Uh, it's crazy when you see it, man. <clears throat> I know, but like I said, what can I do? I'm, you know, Galileo. I mean, yeah, the truth eventually comes out. It might take it might take a little time. It comes. <laughs> the worm is turning. The worm is turning, man. Excellent. All right, brother. All right. God All right. bless. Take God care bless. of yourself. And uh good luck to you and your family, man. And hopefully we'll uh we'll talk to you soon. See you, buddy. <laughs>